Good morning, good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> We're glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. Whether you're present with us in the building or you're watching online, we welcome you. And we thank you for uh, taking time out of your schedule, out of your day to be with us today. Um, would you stand with me as I, as I pray and we begin our worship service this morning? Lord, we are grateful for the opportunity to be in your house. We love you. We thank you that we are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and that we can come into this place corporately and lift up the name of Jesus and that we can be surrounded by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit as we worship you. We thank you for it, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Are you past the point of weary? Is your burden weighing heavy? Is it all too much to carry? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Do you feel that empty feeling? Cause shame's done all it's stealing. Are you desperate for some healing? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Oh, he makes a way.
Starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Sing, Your name is power. Your name is power. from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Sing it again, shout Jesus from the mountains, shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in
over every heart and every mind because I know there's peace within your presence I speak Jesus There's peace within the presence of God. There's power. There's healing. This morning, Father, we call upon your name. We ask that you would heal those that you will in this moment, at this time, Father. And for as long as we endure whatever ails us, whatever ails those who are in our lives, God, we pray that you would provide us and make us aware of your presence and your comfort. You are with us while we endure. We are not alone, but you are with us. Your word says that your power is made perfect in our weakness. So this morning, we depend upon you. We lean into your power and your presence and your strength, God. Comfort those this morning. Comfort those who are in despair, who are sick, Father, who are hurting, Lord. Do what only you can do, Father. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we bring up the lights, we'd like to just take a few minutes, as we typically do, and go about the room, shake some hands, hug some necks, uh, greet some people this morning. As we make our way back to our seats, uh, we're going to continue this morning in our worship through giving. Uh, This is a time when we give back to the Lord based on what he's given to us. You know, he 
so loved us. He's provided everything in our lives. Everything that we have uh, was given to us by God. And so this is our time to respond in giving back to his kingdom. So as the gentlemen come to take up the offering this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are thankful. We are thankful that you have provided for our each and every need, that you provide for your children. You are the God of provision, and we don't go without. We're thankful that you've given us opportunities to further your kingdom through the resource that you've provided. We pray that this morning that what is given would go to bless the kingdom of God and would further its efforts, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to do a new song this morning. It's called Speak to the Mountains. Um, remember that the communion elements are available for you too to serve yourself during the worship if you'd like.
We serve a great, great God. He's mighty. He's worthy of all of our praise. And we come together like this, to gather as the body of Christ, as brothers and sisters. We come to lift up the holy name of Jesus. It's not about our preferences. It's not about what's going on in our lives. It's about the Holy One. It's about lifting up our great, great Father. He's worthy of all of our praise. He's worthy of all of our adoration, our submission. He is good and He is perfect in a world that may not make sense, in a world that is full of uncertainty. He is certain. We thank you, Father. We're thankful that you've given us a family to belong to. We're thankful that we're thankful that we've been given an opportunity to come before you and to bow down before you, to worship you, to lift our hands, to lift our voices in unison, to glorify you. Thank you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we bring up the lights, you may be seated. Those kids right now who are 4 through 11, I forgot to dismiss you a little bit earlier, so you may hop up and follow Miss Amber right over this direction. She is waiting on you. I know they're having a lot of fun up there. If you have not got a chance to go up there and look around to see what all has been done, you need to do so. They are enjoying the, uh, I was going to call it the Ada, the Ada Outback, but there's not much Ada Outback. They've, they've more closely resembled the Australian Outback back there, so out there. So it's a, it's a lot of fun. I know the kids are enjoying it, um, and we're thankful for those who've participated to put all that together for everyone. So you've been getting a steady dose of me this morning. My dad is out with my mom, who's recovering from surgery. So uh, they're, she's doing well, um, recovering in that. So that's, that's what they're doing. They're probably watching me online, critiquing uh, and judging my every move. No, they're not, I'm kidding. They don't, uh, they don't do that. Um, but we, I'm positive, knowing my dad, he's tuned in right now. Uh, this morning, uh, this is a topic as I was praying about this message this week, um, I was thinking about all that's going on around the world and all that's going on in our lives, and I really felt led to share on this particular topic. And I mentioned it in the prayer just a little bit earlier. Um, There's a lot of uncertainty in our world and in our lives today. And so the question is, what can actually, what actually is certain? What can we actually be confident in when there's so much that is uncertain. We're going to be in Romans 5 this morning, starting in verse 1, Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we ask this morning that you would reveal to us the truth of your Scripture, that you would help us to understand your will and your ways. We present ourselves this morning without an agenda, without uh, our own Um, preconceived notions about what is certain in life and what isn't certain, what is uncertain and what is certain, Father. But this morning we lean into your word, what your word reveals that we can count on and that which we cannot count on. I present myself this morning to you, Father, humbly. Free me of my own pride and my own will and my own desire, Lord, and let the words that I proclaim be birthed of your spirit, be birthed of the word of God. 
for the uplifting, for the building up of the church, for the glorifying of you, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Uncertainty. There may not be a better word to better describe the current age in which we live than that word. I can only speak mainly from the Western world view. I don't know every single detail going on around the world. I get snippets of it as you do. You, maybe you follow it a little more closely than I do. I don't get as much uh, in, that, in my regular routine of what's going on there, but at least from what's going on in our Western world, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. We're uncertain of the future economic climate, the future and the near future. We don't really know what's to come day by day with the economic climate, whether it's inflation, gas prices, retirement funds, everything is up and down. We just can't be certain about what the future holds within our economy. We're uncertain about our personal safety and that of our family. There seem to be shootings going on around our nation, that of the world as well, but we hear the most about what's going on within our nation. There's violence or injustice of all kinds going on at all times. COVID is still affecting people. I got messages this week of three or four different people within our church congregation who have COVID. It seems like it's something we've forgotten about a little bit, but it's something that's still plaguing our society, that people are still getting this illness. So we're uncertain about personal safety, health of ourselves and that of our family. And aside from the, the uncertainties that are going on that are more universal uncertainties, each individual in this room right now has various uncertainties of life. Job security, our health, bills, marriages, relationships, families, just the future in general. As we think about the future, there's so much uncertainty. There's all kinds of uncertainty in our lives. I hear people talk about this is what I'm going to go and do, and this is, what I'm, this is my plan, this is what I'm, my, I'm planning to do. And me personally, my own convictions, I can't help but think, how do you even know? There's just so much uncertainty. We just don't know what the next day holds. Between news, social media, conversations that we just have in daily life, one-on-one -on -one conversations, or just the circumstances of life, it's easy to allow what is uncertain about life outweigh what is certain. It's easy to allow all the things that we are trying to figure out, we're trying to gain certainty, we're trying to gain clarity about, to outweigh that which is certain. Why? Before that, this morning, my, my primary objective this morning in this message is to help us shift our attention from all that is not certain in life to that which is certain. Because there's great flourishing and life and joy and peace found in, in discovering what is certain and allowing ourselves, freeing ourselves of that which is not certain. So why does uncertainty tend to outweigh what is certain? Here is the very difficult truth about that. In this life, everything that is earthly, everything that is subjected to sin, and brokenness is uncertain. Everything is uncertain. Beginning with, we don't even know how long 
we have to live. Job famously says in Job 14 that a man's days are numbered by God with limits that we cannot pass. We also learn from Job's life that health, family, and prosperity are all uncertainties of life. Many of us don't even have to experience what Job experienced because we can personally attest to that uncertainty. Can anyone in this room think of an experience in life or think of many, many experiences in life when there was a lot of uncertainty? Or in your life right now, thinking of what is uncertain? I can be the first to say there are uncertain things about my life right now that I do not know what's to come. The author of Proverbs says in chapter 27, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And for many of us, tomorrow is a given. Many of us do not worry about waking up and breathing tomorrow. We don't even think about it. It's just something that happens naturally for us, does it not? We don't think about that, most of us. But our uncertainty typically extends beyond that. It's not usually just dependent upon will I wake up tomorrow, will I live tomorrow, will I breathe tomorrow. It usually extends beyond just living and breathing. But James 4.13 says this, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will travel to such and such city and spend a year there and do business and make a profit. He says, yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring, what your life will be. And then this line, for you are like a vapor that appears for a little while then vanishes. If the very breath of our lungs is so uncertain, if it's such a small portion of all of the life that God has to give, how can anything else be very certain? Are you following me? If the very life that we have, if Scripture says that we don't even know what tomorrow will bring, we don't know how many days we have. God has numbered our days. That means tomorrow is uncertain. So whether circumstances in life feel certain or not, whether you feel certain about what's to come, the reality is that all of life is actually uncertain. We don't actually know what the de- next day may bring. Ecclesiastes seven fourteen. this is a passage that has been in the back of my mind for many years now. I forget how long ago it was, maybe eight years ago or so, that this, this particular verse got plugged into my head, and I cannot forget it to this day. Ecclesiastes 7.14 says this, In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider, God has made one as well as the other. I'm going to read that again. In the day of prosperity be joyful, but in the day of adversity consider that God has made one one as well as the other. He's made the day of prosperity. He's made the day of adversity. Why? So that no one can discover anything that will come after him. He's created the days of prosperity and adversity that we can't take anything for granted in this life. Not even tomorrow. The New Living translates that particular passage. It says that nothing is certain. Nothing is certain. I know right now many of you are thinking, this is the most discouraging message. 
in the world. I'm laying before you all that is uncertain of life. And what I'm saying, what you're hearing me say, is that everything is uncertain. Not according to me, but according to God's Word. Whether it's prosperity, whether it's adversity. Whether it's life, whether it's death. We can't be certain what tomorrow may bring. It sounds discouraging. Some of you are wishing you had stayed home. Some of you did stay home, and you're wishing you didn't tune in. But I promise, there's good news to come. So we transition. We transition from all that is not certain in this life, all that is not certain, to what is certain. What can we be absolutely certain of? Because here's the truth. If we focus on all that is uncertain in life, and, and we get caught up in all that I just laid out about the uncertainty of life, that doesn't result in a very peaceful life, does it? It doesn't result in, in much hope if we get focused on all that we just do not know, all that is unpredictable, despite what we plan, despite what we think, to, think is, is going to come, we cannot be certain that it's going to come to pass. In the passage I read earlier with, in James 4.13, it follows that passage saying that you shouldn't, you shouldn't pray in a way that says, this is what I'm going to go and do because your life is just a, a wisp of time. It says to instead pray that if it's God's will, I will live, and then I will go do this. So it says, if it's God's will, I will live. This is the way we should pray. First, if it's God's will, I will live. If it's His will, I'll wake up tomorrow, and then this is what I'll go do if it's according to His will. If it's in God's will, this is what I'll go and do. But it begins with just, if God grants me another day, this is what I'll go and do. So what can we be certain of? There are three things in our opening passage that we started with that reveals what we can be absolutely certain of. Let's read it again, Romans 5, starting in verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have also obtained access through Him by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Before we get into the certainties that this particular passage presents, it's important to note that it begins, to, it begins by speaking to a specific group of people. These certainties are not available to everyone. There's a specific group of people it identifies. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, it is speaking to those who have been justified by faith. For those of us who are believers, those of us who've placed our faith in the atoning work of Christ, and we have repented of our sin, to be justified means that we have been found innocent. Our sin has been forgiven. Years ago, I heard this pastor put it this way, and this story, this, this analogy, I should say, has stuck in my head ever since that time. He says, here's what it's like to be justified by your faith. It's as if we've all seen those cases throughout history where we're reading, all, has anyone ever really done the, the deep dive on an ongoing case that's gotten national media attention and we follow it on the news, we follow it on social media, we follow it uh, in newspapers, wherever we follow, we follow every single detail. And all of the details, all of the evidence points to this person is guilty. Has anybody ever followed something like that? And you're like, without a doubt, this person is guilty. That's our story. Without a doubt, every single one of us was guilty. All of the evidence points to our guilt. But being justified by our faith says that the judge said you're innocent. Despite your foolproof uh, uh, 
guilt, despite all the evidence pointing to the fact that you were guilty of sin, the judge says, you are forgiven. That is the truth of being justified by faith. I don't know about you, but that's like a warm blanket to my soul. That I was guilty without a doubt, but my loving Savior forgave me. And now I've been justified by faith. Maybe that just excites me. So the opening line that this passage presents is the linchpin for these three certainties. So it's important to note that these certain realities are only for those who've been justified by faith. For those of us who are in Christ, those of us who are our believers, these are those three certainties. The first certainty found in the latter half of verse 1 is this. For those of us who've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Before we were redeemed, we were alienated from God. The nature of our sin placed us at war with God. We were separated from Him. As sinners, we were enemies with God. And now we are at peace or considered friends with God. Paul says in Romans 5, further down in that particular passage, past what, past what we opened with this morning, says, For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of His Son, while we were still His enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of His Son. We were enemies of God, but through being justified by faith, we are now friends of God. We are at peace with God. Because there is a kingdom of darkness and there is a kingdom of light. That's it. There are only two kingdoms. There's nothing in between those two kingdoms. There's one of light, there's one of darkness. When we were enemies, we belonged to the kingdom of darkness. When we were redeemed, when we were justified by our faith, we entered the kingdom of light. One of those kingdoms is at peace with God. One of those kingdoms is, is not. What comes with the peace of God? What comes along with being at peace with God? I'm not speaking about specifically the, the peace of that the Spirit of God gives us, but I'm talking about the peace that was brought in reconciling us to the Father through Christ Jesus. Aside from no longer being His enemy, being at peace with God means that we don't have to fear punishment. If we continue in our faithfulness, we don't have to fear punishment because we are at peace with God. We are friends with Him. Our inheritance is in heaven. We've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. When we sin in our faithful efforts, when we are being faithful and we fail and we sin, He's not there waiting to punish us, but instead willing to forgive. All we have to do is repent of our sin, and He's waiting to forgive. Why? Because we are no longer enemies of God. We are friends. We are at peace with God. Being at peace with God means that we don't have to fear death. When your, her when your inheritance is heaven, death isn't the end of anything. The death in this life, when we are friends of God, when we are when we've been reconciled to the Father through the Son, death is not the end. It's the entering of the kingdom of heaven. It's that transition. So because we've been justified by faith, the first certainty we have is we can be certain of peace with God. The second certainty we see in verse 2. Because we have been justified by faith, we have obtained 
access to the grace in which we stand. It was by God's grace that we were saved. We didn't deserve it, but he saved us. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just, the grace doesn't just stop in in what he did to save us. It's interesting that the, the, the particular tense of this word that Paul chooses to use here, the word stand, we stand, suggests a continuing position within God's grace, meaning that it happened, we are standing, we stand, but it's also continue. We continue to stand in God's grace, meaning that nothing will remove us from the center of God's grace. Matthew Henry's commentary on this particular uh, chapter in these verses says this. It reads like this. In using this particular tense, Paul is not saying that we are standing here now and maybe later we will go stand somewhere else. It means that we stand firm that we are fixed on this spot in the way that a boat is securely moored to the dock. No storm of circumstances can move us from where we stand. The fact that we are tightly, permanently moored to the dock of God's grace provides us with a strong sense of security. Nothing can tear us away from God's grace. That means we are permanently standing in God's power and presence, made available through Christ's blood. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19, and then in 22, if you put these two particular passages together, it says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. We now have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, into the grace of God, in the center of the grace of God. This is access, this access to grace that we obtained was through our faith in Jesus. We can enter into His presence because we have been justified. We are standing in the midst of God's grace because we believe. What comes with the grace of God? The word grace is is packed full of meaning. It's said that grace is one of the great distinctions between the many, if we categorize Christianity as a religion, of the many religions of the world. It's said that grace is one of the things that stands apart in many of the major religions because many of the major religions, they're things that you have to earn by your works. But in the kingdom of God, grace says you didn't deserve this, you didn't earn this, but this grace was freely given to you out of love by our Father. So what comes with the grace of God? I'm not going to spend the whole time on here. As I was studying this, I thought I could just, I could do a whole message. I could maybe do a whole series on the particular topic of grace, and maybe I will someday. But I'm going to just touch on a few things here. Grace is this continual source of power and strength for all circumstances of life. Everywhere we lack, God's grace has the power to fill. In 2 Corinthians 12, 19, Jesus tells Paul this, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. His grace is enough for us, despite anything that's going on in our lives, despite all of the uncertainties, despite anything that we are facing. He says that His grace is sufficient. Why? Because all of those uncertainties, all that's going on, all of the calamities represent weakness. And what does the passage say? It says that His power is made perfect 
in our weakness. We're better off in our weakness than we are in our own strength. I know that sounds counter, counterintuitive. That doesn't sound correct. But a reliance on His power is greater than any power that we can will ourselves to. His grace is a place of safety where, we're most, where we are comforted in despair. It's where we can be filled with joy, yet be in the midst of sorrow. Is in the midst of His grace. So because we have been justified by faith, we can now be certain that we remain in God's grace. The third certainty this morning, the first certainty is that we are at peace with God. The second, that we are standing permanently in the midst, in the center of God's grace. And the third certainty is we see in the latter half of verse 2. Because we have been justified by faith, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This hope is, as we look ahead in life, as we look to the future, we know that death isn't the end of the story. Hope represents this confident anticipation of what's beyond, of what's to follow this life. That's where our hope is. Hope is not a possibility. Biblical hope. It's not a possibility. It's not wishfulness. It's a confident anticipation of what's to come. It's confidence on what God's Word says is to come. For everyone that has been justified by faith, you have the promise of God that He will do what He says He will do. That's the hope that we have in God. When the uncertainties of life begin to overwhelm us, we begin to be consumed with all that we don't know, with all that we don't know to expect, with all that we don't have confidence in, that we, we just don't know what's to come. The place that is, this is waging war against is our hope. It's placing in question our hope. It should serve as an indication for us that my trust in God is wavering. I'm looking to the circumstances of life. I'm trying to make things make sense. I'm trying to control the outcomes of life. I don't trust that the Lord, that all that the Lord is doing, that, the, that I'm standing in God's midst. I'm in the midst of His grace and that it, it doesn't matter what tomorrow holds. I am at peace with God. I am standing in His grace, and I have hope of His glory. When we consume ourselves with this uncertainty, we've unwittingly placed our hope somewhere between today and the day that we pass from this life. When the uncertainties overwhelm us, that means we're only looking at the 30 years, the 40 years, the 50 years, the 60 years, the how many ever years that God has granted us, how many ever days that He has numbered for us, when that becomes, when the uncertainties of life become overwhelming to us, that has become the hope. The hope is between now and when I pass on from this life. That's when uncertainties have overwhelmed us. Because my hope has become not in God's glory, not in the hope of God's glory, but in something earthly. I need to know something earthly. I need this to come to pass. I need this to happen in my life. 
but we can't be certain of those things. Properly placed hope is the absolute north star for the life of the believer. Because when our hope is in the kingdom of heaven, our hope is in the glory of God. It determines the decisions I make each and every day. Am I making a decision? Am I viewing the life that I'm living through the lens in which I'll be living 2,000 years from now? Or I'll be living 20 years from now? Or two years from now? Or two days from now? The centering statement for myself is that. And I have to do this regularly. 2,000 years from now, how will this matter? What's worrying me today? What I'm uncertain of today, 2,000 years from now, when I'm living in eternity, how will this matter? How does this play into the infinite amount of time, this little wisp of time, this little matter now, this small uncertainty now, how does it play into 2,000 years from now? Hope is centering for us. Lewis Smedes, in his book, Standing on the Promises, says this, Hope is to our spirits what oxygen is to our lungs. Lose hope and you die. They may not bury you for a while, but without hope, you are dead inside. The hope we have is centered on the faith that we have in God's promises not in making sense of everything this life has in store. It's not making sense of everything that is to come. Our hope is in the promises of God. Because the truth is this. Because the truth is, if Jesus really raised from the dead and ascended to the Father, then everything in the Word is true. Everything is true. Everything is to be believed. That is our hope. Despite the circumstances that disagree with what I see, what I can visually see in the world today, what is uncertain, what is unclear, what doesn't make any sense, is a lie to God's Word. Because only what God's Word says is certain and is true. As I bring all of these things together this morning, the uncertainties and the certainties. Uncertainty of life distracts. It derails us. It blinds us from, what, from that which is certain. It fools us into thinking that we have control over the various outcomes of life. I'm a recovering control freak to some degree. Is anybody else like to have control? Does anybody else like to have control over the circumstances and the things of life? I like to know what's to come. I like to know what is certain. I want to make things clear. I want that thing that doesn't make sense. I have questions about that with God. God, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why would this be allowed? Why would this happen? Why is this happening? And if I let it, it can consume me in spending all of my time making clear what is not clear. But uncertainty is an inevitable reality for this life. And in fact, according to Ecclesiastes 7.14, and that's why I say this passage has been in my head and will not leave for a number of years now, is because of this. We read this earlier. The reality is that the uncertainty of life, if I read this passage correctly, is by design. Ecclesiastes 7.14, I'll read it again. In the day of prosperity, be joyful, but in the day of adversity, consider God has made one as well as the other, so that no one can discover anything that will come after him. Uncertainty is part of the design of the Creator. Does that sound confusing to anybody else? Wouldn't it be easier to have certainty? Wouldn't it be great to know? But it says so that no one 
can discover what anything discover anything that will come after him. Or as the New Living Translation said, that no one would be certain. Why wouldn't God want us to know what was to come? Why wouldn't he want us to be certain? You know, earlier we read that his power is made perfect in our weakness. So why wouldn't he want us to know his power is made perfect in our weakness? We have to trust on, we have to trust him. We have to depend on Him so that He can care for our every need. We were designed to depend on God. We were designed to depend on God. Whether it's a day of adversity, whether it's a day of prosperity, consider that both have come from God so that we do not know what is certain about life, but we do know what is certain about God, that we can depend on Him. So what's been revealed to me is this. It was as I was studying this, this just came alive to me, the Spirit revealed this to me, is that we should welcome the uncertainty of life because it's an opportunity for us to draw near to our Father and depend on Him, to trust Him, and allow His strength to be perfected in our weakness. The uncertainty of life allows for our Father to care for us, to be our Father, to care for, our, for our, each and every need. So the certainty today that believers do have in this world full of uncertainty, these are the things that are certain. We are at peace with God, meaning that we live in freedom. We don't fear the punishment of God because we've been redeemed. We've been justified by our faith. We are standing in His grace, meaning that we live in presence and in power. And the third, we do have hope in His glory, meaning that we can live full of joy because all of the circumstances of life, nothing can take from us what the Father has given to us, of that, is, that is eternal. Life, everything fades away. Everything comes and goes. Everything is uncertain. But what God has promised to us will never fade. It is what is certain. The blessing that God has for us isn't turning uncertainty, isn't turning the unknown into the known, isn't turning uncertainty into certainty, it's not providing all the answers to the questions that we have in life. We have something better. We have His grace. It's more powerful than knowledge. It's strength in our weakness. It's comfort in our suffering. It's peace in the midst of darkness. It's mercifulness in our failures. That Father that's willing to forgive us when we've sinned, when we've fallen short. His grace saved us and is sustaining us. Brothers and sisters, today we stand in the grace of God. Nothing can take us from the grace of God if we faithful if we're faithful to follow Him, we're faithful to commit our lives to Him, nothing can take us from the center of God's grace. It was a gift freely given to you and I. And so a closing thought this morning. For those of us who've been justified through faith, we can find rest in what is certain for us. Because everything that is certain is eternal. 
Everything that is certain is from the Lord and is lasting. My hope this morning for all of us is that we see this truth. We see that the world is uncertain. Life is uncertain. But that God is certain. We can be certain that we have peace with God. We are at peace with God. We can be certain that we are standing in His grace. We can be certain that we have hope in the glory of God. If you've been wrestling with uncertainty in life, as we bow our heads, I pray that you would submit that unto God. God, I've been uncertain. I've been trying to figure everything out and I've missed the fact that you've already secured for me everything that I need. You've made me at peace. When I became a believer, you made me at peace with God. You gave me access. I obtained access to the presence and the power of the grace of God. You gave me hope. Hope of the glory of God. Those three certainties can outweigh all of the uncertainty that this life has to throw at me. You are all that is certain. This morning we welcome the uncertainty of life. Because Father, we know that we get to depend upon you. We get to lean into your strength. We get to lean into your power. We get to remain in your presence because all that is uncertain allows you to be powerful. It allows you to be comforting. It allows you to provide. It allows you to sustain us, to strengthen us. You get to be the good, loving Father that you desire to be to your children. Your uncertainty places us nearest to your heart. So we welcome that this morning, Father. It's by your design and we welcome it. We step into not knowing, Father. We don't have clear answers about the world. We don't have clear answers about life, God, but we do about you and your promise. Thank you, Lord. And for those this morning who have not been justified by faith, who don't have any certainties in life, God, I pray that the Spirit would reveal to them now. I believe that your Spirit would, I ask that your Spirit would draw them unto you, Father. Reveal to them, God, that they are at war with you. but that you desire for them to be at peace with you. You desire to call them friend. You desire to call them son, daughter. Reveal that in hearts this morning, Father. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. This week, as we go forward, don't let this message die today. Become aware of the moments in life when things become uncertain. Remember what is certain. What is certain about God? What is certain that is eternal? Your true hope. Remember that as we go about the week. Amen? Be blessed this week. Pray for someone. Take someone to lunch. Something of that nature. Be blessed. Amen.